Hi again, welcome to Wessex Ways. I am Headley. And I am Paul. And uh, what what do you do, Paul? Uh, I just I make videos and put them on YouTube and waffle about generally the south of England, largely Wessex. What about you, Headley? What do you, who are you, Headley? What do you do? Well, that's a good question. Um, I am uh, known uh, as an aerial photographer of historic landscapes, uh, but uh, YouTuber sounds no, you don't know. You're not a YouTuber, are you? You're a filmmaker <laughs> and YouTubers, you're out there. But either way, what you do is what all of my kids want to do when they grow up. So uh, <laughs> all the kids do, don't they? All the kids <laughs> they do. do. They do. And what have you been up to this last oh, uh, couple of well, weeks or I've, so? I've made a video with you, Headley. I don't know if you remember, but last week we went out and made a video, didn't we? Yeah, I seem to remember something happening. It's, it's quite good, yes. yes. And the sun was shining, and what a, what a good day that was. Yes, it was. And I think we've hopefully now put to bed uh, something that we've been waffling a long time on here about, it seems a long time now, four episodes worth, where we've been <laughs> debating the true source of the River Thames, which sends everyone to sleep now we've done it so often. So I think uh, we decided that that was a good foundation for a video of yours and uh, yeah. that I think without giving anything away I think uh, we've probably come to the a conclusion I think so yeah I think so it was it was a good day it was mm. it, it seemed to flow excuse the pun it seemed to flow very well so mm. um yeah I'm I'm pleased with it. I hope it I hope it does well I hope it really hope mm. it does well. it's about time because it's been a bit rubbish on YouTube lately January always That's, is yeah um, but so yeah. no but honestly it i found it really fun i've i've been on a what this is the third video i've been involved with yours now and it was just it's some it's an itch i've had to scratch for a while this this source of the thames thing mm. and uh, as you probably noticed and i just think i was i had fairly high expectations going into that day i was quite yeah. excited as you know and it exceeded it it was brilliant um, I, I've learned quite a lot from that day. So, <laughs> good <yes>. stuff. I mean, <laughs> yes. other than, other than that, we've done a couple of walks along the Wilts and Barks Canal. Um, other and, and outside of that, I've just been editing like a machine <laughs> lately. I've, I'm sort of two or three videos ahead, which is a rare thing. So I've got mm. two videos published for the next two weeks already, which is very rare uh, for me. So I've, I've sort of spent about two or three days just editing, 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 mm. including that Thames video that we did, the source of the Thames. Mm. Um, oh, I put so much work into that in terms of all of the different facets of it. And again, we're, we're not going to go into detail now, but no. there, there's a lot of different facets to that video and trying mm. to sort of um, make it into a YouTube video without being a YouTube video and still trying to um, make it a, a film that we put on YouTube. Um, yes, but I'm, I'm going to waffle yeah. about YouTube a bit later, Headley. Um, so yeah. we'll come I, to that. I want, we'll come to that a bit later. I want that video to do well. I mean, it's just, it's just something that I found really, really fascinating. And yeah, it's a good day out. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah. yeah, where about some? Where about some of the Kennet and Avon? Did you walk? Not the Kennet Avon. The Wilts and Barks. The Wilts and pardon. Barks. Wilts and Barks. Yeah. We did. There's a stretch which has got um, seven locks, literally. Hmm. So if you imagine Cane Hill locks, but smaller. Yeah. Okay. Um, seven locks and it's kind of between Dauncey and let's just say uh, South West Swindon so think of okay. um, Roughton and go down mm. the Wilson Barks another 10 miles or less mm. than maybe 10 miles maybe four, five or six miles South West of Wil uh, Swindon mm. and you come to an old stretch where there was seven locks on the Wilson Barks Canal they've done up sort of three or four of them they've parked done up one uh, one of them's completely abandoned and destroyed and there's nothing there. So there's quite mm. a mix of um, bits to see, shall we say, on that small stretch. It's only like half a mile. Mm. Um, there's four or five different landowners. Some give permission. Some, is, if it's a pathway, some of it is not permissive and completely do not enter, otherwise you'll be shot. Um, so even that half mile stretch, it proved quite an interesting um, half a day. So that's a film coming mm. soon. Mm. Um, yeah, fascinating little place, and um, 
definitely advise um, everyone to go and have a walk there, but not past the um, barbed wire, passive aggressive <laughs> um, gentleman that owns a last stretch. But more of that in the video. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah, so I've, I've I've come across one or two people like that myself on my travels. To be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not fun. But there we go. Need, yeah. Needs must. So yeah. what are you headed? What what have you been up to in the last couple of weeks, other than oh. making videos with famous YouTubers? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, top of my list, obviously. Um, so um, that sounded sarcastic, didn't it? Didn't it? Um, so yeah, I did a. Uh, oh, what have I done? So I've done a thirteen mile Ridgeway hike on my own in the wet, oh. in the rain, in the wind, in the cold, um, and that that for a big lad like me was quite a challenge. I'll be honest with you. Um, I did another walk around Whitnam Clumps and along the Thames there. So the Earth Trust, who own Whitnam Clumps, uh, have got something called River of Life, where they're kind of managing the, the banks of the river and they're creating newt ponds and and things like that. Yeah. Um, so sort of exploring that a little bit. Uh, I had a meeting with them as well because I've got my uh, exhibition coming up there. Um, I did another walk, which was nine miles. That was Lowbury Hill. So yeah. local to me. Um, Lowbury Hill will probably be my subject. In fact, will be my subject a bit later on because it's my favourite place locally. Um, went over to Aldworth to visit the best pub in Britain, uh, mm -hmm. the Bell. Um, you go in, they got uh, sort of camera awards, so the campaign for real Ale awards all oh, okay. over the walls, and the place hasn't been refurbished since probably the I don't know since Saxon times probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it means it's authentic it's nice it's all stone and the, the yeah. food's lovely and drink. I'm, I'm not promoting it um, I went to see Aldworth Church which has got the uh, Aldworth Giants in and I'm not going to describe that now because I haven't researched that um, but beautiful church Saxon church so 1200 years old with the original yew tree in the grounds oh I love that um, yeah, uh, I, did, I met up with some bloke and his missus to find the source of the Thames. Really? Uh, that was a good day out. Uh, so what else did I do? Yeah, so um, I was invited. I posted a picture on Instagram um, of an old barn that I passed on the Thames. And the farmer contacted me and yeah. said, um, that's my barn. And I thought that was the beginning of a conversation <clears throat> about flying drones over property. But in mm -hmm. fact, uh, it transpired <clears throat> he wanted photos taken <clears throat> of his farmhouse as well. So right. that turned into a drone job. Uh, and wow, what a place. Beautiful. I'm not going to say where it was, uh, obviously for privacy use, uh, reasons, but beautiful, beautiful farmhouse, uh, beautiful grounds. Um, we met a guy, uh, when we were looking around the grounds, uh, we met a guy who was uh, doing some deer shooting, um, okay. obviously quite controversial, um, but he crawled out of the bushes wearing full SIS <laughs> camouflage gear with what looked to be a five foot gun over his shoulder and oh a tripod and it's like scared the living hell out of me. Yeah. Uh, so that was quite good. Um I did an evening shoot uh, of the Whitnam Clumps while it was flooded. That was, again, really, really beautiful. And uh, what else did I do? I think that's bad. Oh, no. Yeah, so at work, uh, Terminal 4 baggage went down on my shift. So yeah. I had to recover uh, Terminal 4 uh, Heathrow from an IT fault. So we got there, which was the main thing. So that was quite good. <laughs> a fun week, then. <laughs> <laughs> fun week yeah and that's some fun big week. walks as well you know i mean 13 miles is a long way i mean it, it is in the bad yeah. weather yeah the it's, eggs yes absolutely yeah, yeah that's the key isn't if it? you're i find if you're on your own it, it feels a bit longer so if you go yep. for a hike with friends so we did a 15 and a half mile one recently similar kind of route with friends and yeah. you're talking the whole way, and before you know it, it's over. Yeah, agreed, um, yeah. But if if you're on your own, it, it just feels like it's going on forever yeah. sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's quite good. Um, you know, was out today as well, went to find the source of the the the, the Ginge or Ginge Brook. Um, not quite as glamorous as finding the source of the Thames. Oh, yeah, but, um, I, but I'm now a bit obsessed with this because I saw your mm. I saw that post. And I haven't had time to have a look at it properly in terms of what it is or what it was. But I, I again, mm. it just piques your interest, doesn't it? You just thought, oh, okay. Mm. 
And all of a sudden, yeah. like, right, I'm going to have a look at that later because that's, uh, you know, it, it, who cares if it's the Thames or if it's the Seven or whatever. I think I was having withdrawal symptoms from the video that we made. Yeah. And, and it was kind of like, but it wasn't quite as spectacular, you know, whilst <clears throat> you had us traipsing all over the Cotswolds. This was kind of like we got two, three miles down the road and there's the source. And it's like, well, that's that. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, but but how did you know the source? What, what gave you the, what, what, what um, did you know the source? We did this without maps. So I knew where it flowed. And yeah. so we went there and just followed it upstream, uh, which <laughs> didn't last very long because it, you know, a quarter of a mile upstream, it just came out the ground. I'm like, well, there it is. Then. Okay. And so is it, up, it was a spring. Beyond almost. that is the hills. It is a spring, basically. It's yeah. a culverted spring. Um, but the water is so clear because it's a chalk stream. Um, yeah. I think, you know, Fergal Sharkey on the you know, 80s yeah. uh, pop star, um, he's obsessed on Twitter with chalk streams and their, their management and care. Yeah. And um, he would have loved this. I mean, it was absolutely, the water was clear as a bell. And underneath, it's kind of, you've got chalk along the side and underneath you can actually see the bedrock. So it's, it wow. was really, really clear. Um, but yeah, it was, it was good. And then we went back up and found Grimm's Ditch. So uh, I'm slowly simmering in the background of a project with Anna Dillon on uh, photographing and her painting Grimm's Ditch through the Berkshire Downs. So oh, we've been lovely. mapping it out from above, from the air. And yeah. so I've got a little bit of that in today as well. And got uh, quite a prominent right. section of it. Which is I don't, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but uh, mm. I, I, Grimm's Ditch is a fascination. It really is a fascination. Or Grimm's Dyke or Grimm the Devil's Ditch or whatever it's called. Mm. Uh, and it, it, I, I'm continually obsessed with it. And yet not going to make a video out of it yet because I mm. don't know how to sell it or do it or talk about it or... It gets it's so a normal. difficult one. Yeah, it's really difficult because where do it you is. start? Where do you start? And it's also not just one ditch either. So no, that it's it's old enough not to have an explanation of of what it was and yeah. why it's there. However, what we have noticed is where we found Grimm's Ditch or one of the Grimm's Ditches through the Berkshire Downs. It roughly follows modern parish boundaries, and that then a bit like ones like kind of puts it into a yeah uh, a, you, you know what i mean um a maybe semi defensive <clears throat> yeah. uh dividing kind of thing you know um so it doesn't seem to be it, it just doesn't really have an explanation uh and the funny thing is when we we were flying the drone in the summer in you know when we had 40 degrees in july you know everyone mm. else was kind of pouring mm -hmm. water over themselves and staying indoors with fans on whereas i grabbed my drone and you know sweated my way up onto the downs and and sent it up and you could see grim's ditch in areas that it's just not mapped it's yeah. a perfect line going along the ground so yeah um we've we've managed to map quite a lot of it and um you know, yeah but, did you see but selling it's a difficult one it is yeah <laughs> did you see the post that i did in your group um with a map yesterday I don't remind me. Right, so I, it, it was probably yesterday lunchtime or something. I put a mm. a post. Mm. It was only a map of like a, mm. a an OS map from like nineteen hundred or eighteen ninety, and mm. it was a section of um, Grimm's Ditch, which said mm. mapped in eighteen ninety, but they would labelled it Roman Road, and I've been fascinated mm. with it for a long time because there's a section mm. Grovely Wood to the west of Salisbury. So if you go Salisbury. Um, towards the Mendips, but only just that sort of Salisbury, Wilton, up into mm. the ridge um, along the woods, Grovely Woods. There's mm. Grimm's Ditch, mm. and it, it but it wiggles like really, really, really wiggles. Um, mm. There's even a bit where it's S shaped; it almost goes back on itself. But the yes. map makers of the time labelled that Roman Road, and I'm just like that's just that's bonkers. Clearly, it's bonkers it's yeah. because a hundred yards north of it is the Roman Road. And if you go there, okay. you can see the Roman Road. You can see the agra of the Roman mm. Road perfectly straight all the way through Grovely Woods and on to the Mendips. Mm. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, uh, my fascination and obsession of the moment is not so much how they got it wrong, because yeah. that's fine. Mistakes happened and, p and people talk, they talk to locals. What's this called? What's that called? That's how mistakes happened. Fine. But it's kind of like, how did it stick? Then every map, there's about five or six other maps until 1920, which all mm. label this S shape. I mean, literally an S goes back on itself and under at one point. That's it, yeah. And it That's wiggles right, yeah. all the way underneath these woods 
I mean, properly mm. wiggles, not even mm. following the contour, it just wiggles. And they labelled it Roman Road for about three or four miles, Roman Road. And I'm just a, a bit obsessed with why they didn't go, hang on a minute. I don't know, it's a cliche, Roman Roads are straight, they're not really straight, mm. but they do follow straight yeah. lines. But, but they're logical, just, yeah. Yeah, they're logical. This mm. is like an S shape, which is clearly illogical and some. And yet they mm. labelled it Roman Road. And I'm a bit fascinated as to why, not why they made the mistake, because I get they made the mistake, but how they got to that point. Did they take local mm. advice? Did they even look at it? Because it doesn't look like a Roman Road. It looks like a Grim's mm. Ditch. It's got a, a, yeah. a ditch and a, and a bank on one side. Classic mm. Grim's Ditch as there ever was. But mm. they've labelled it Roman Road, and I'm just a bit obsessed with it. <laughs> Frankly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating the, the area around here um, where it goes, because you've got the ridgeway uh, running roughly east to west, and then you've got to the north of the ridgeway at the bottom of the hills. So there's a line of hills. You've got the ridgeway running along the top. You have at yeah. the bottom on the north, you have the Icknilled Way, which now is modern roads mainly. Yeah. And then between the two, you have Grimm's Ditch, which runs sort of halfway up the scarp of the hills all the way along so yeah it, it, it's funny how it's, it's always seems to be on on a slope on the scarp yeah, of the hills. off of the ridge the least, it's always off the ridge yeah, yes yeah. the least logical place to put it so yeah. um why is that but I, yeah i'd love to I I mean, know. yeah metaphorical question but why would that why would they do mm. that they do there's it a section there's a section near lowbury hill where it crosses juniper valley and again i'll waffle on about that in a few minutes but it, it's mapped there and in fact recently it was kind of I'm, I'm trying not to just in case the landowner listens to this on Spotify <laughs> um, I'm trying to be careful here but they had issues with quad bikes going yeah. up there and destroying the land and so the person who I assume is the landowner decided to build a bank and a ditch to stop the bikes going in so the intent was good but in doing so, they also cut through Grimm's Ditch, which is yeah. a scheduled monument, and probably landed themselves in a bit of trouble doing that. But yeah. it continues across Juniper Valley, and then it just disappears. And I had all sorts of theories that it popped up here, here, and here, and you know, been getting the drone up, and we just couldn't fathom it out at all. And we, we still yeah. can't. I know where I'd like it to be, because I've seen earthworks that look like Grimm's Ditch, but it kind of... It's, it's like joining the dots it's kind of there's a bit in between that we yeah. just cannot fathom out at all mm. um and we've tried flying in summer in the middle of the winter and just cannot and we've been looking at lidar as well yeah. um yeah it's, it's a real around lowbury hill it's a real puzzle you've got a very clearly defined grim's ditch there and there and between the two there's a lot going on but yeah you, it's just yeah we can't quite fathom it out but it's no, it's, it's not interesting it's not interesting enough to be a paul and rebecca whitewick video um oh, yeah learn how to say it would be how to say it wouldn't it's, it it's going to be the death of me that one i'll tell you yeah. <laughs> i mean we've got a bit just up um here about six or seven miles from where we are in andover mm. um mm. north of there there's a Tuke causeway which we've done plenty of videos on yeah and there's Grim's Ditch, and as ever, mm. it sits about 100 metres, maybe less than 100 metres, 70 metres off the top of the ridge. And it's mm. crazy how, why, you know, that should mm. tell us what it's about. It should give us a good indication yeah. of why it's there. If they always, or nine times out of ten, it was built off of a ridge, mm. then that should give us yeah. some kind of indication. But if, I feel like it doesn't. And, and yeah, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, if... If it's defensive, then I guess if it's halfway down a ridge and your bit is the high bit behind, yeah, it would be a good place to fight people off as they try and come yeah. up the hill. But I don't know, it, uh, are the Berkshire Downs steep enough for that? And yeah. if that's the case, why don't we see it at really steep places, places like Uffington Whitehorse Hill? And, and yeah. I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. And there's no documentation on it that I know of. And so... If anyone listening to this video on Spotify, get in contact with us. If you're yeah. listening, stroke watching on YouTube, there's a doobly do 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 Any information on Grimm's Ditch that's not just off from Wikipedia, they put it down yeah. there and yeah. Yeah, yeah archae I guess archaeological. I mean, they they date it clearly. Mm. I, I understand it's like five hundred BC and a bit further mm. back. Is that? I think that sounds about right. 
Yeah, so, and again, it's a bit too far back. I mean, you've got, you know, a lot of the Saxon battles are, you know, a, a way after that. You know, you're talking sort of 870, yeah. 860, 865 onwards, and they're documented, and they're usually documented by maybe a priest that was involved in the battle yeah. or something. Um, but going back further, I mean, there's there's nothing on these ditches. No. It's, and the, as you say, they're everywhere. They're, they're, mm. they're quite prevalent. Mm. So news-wise, what news. have I been doing? I've been preparing for my talk at Oxford University on the Ridgeway Day School. Um, yeah, yep, that's... I've written a little bit of that. <laughs> I better get the rest done. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be interesting. I mean, people, not for me, but people like David Miles are speaking there. And, you know, and, and so there's quite a lot of prominent speakers there. And I, I'm getting the impression that I'm kind of the the uh, the half an hour period of relaxation between the more academic types, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be good. I'm going to basically yeah, talk about spot. drone flying on the Ridgeway. Yeah, it's a um, good, good spot to have. Hmm. And I spoke to David Mars about it, actually, and had a good chat with him. Uh, he called me a couple of days back. And um, there's some interesting news coming up. I can't mention it now, but there's potentially some interesting news coming up about the Uffington White Horse. Um, okay. So I might be roped into some photography there. Um, oh, one thing was disputed in the last video. Okay, so I was rabbiting on about drone flying in the last video yep. um so one of my friends russ russ pinder hi russ i know you listen to this <laughs> um great guy flies uh what i call a bug smasher you know a light aircraft <laughs> and does proper aerial <laughs> photography so he's yeah. got a proper slr camera and he's hanging out of his uh, aircraft yeah so I, I can't compete with that obviously um uh, but he he mentioned about the 500 foot I remember I said aircraft can't, can't go yeah. to 500 foot yeah. apparently I was wrong aircraft I'm not going to dispute it you can't get within 500 feet of people so yeah you can go below 500 feet with a light aircraft uh, how does that work then I wonder so you can be know. flying your drone up to 400 feet quite legally yeah. and safely and then Russ comes along in his plane That's who's going to win then, that battle well well <laughs> me because i'm not in my drone yeah <laughs> <You're> <laughs> but just a the few problem is lighter. the problem i have there is that if i do you know if if i do you know crash with russ up there and he falls out of the sky and there's a disaster then the problem is he's usually the one that buys the coffees when we go out so i'm gonna have to start oh, buying so, so, stuff. You've lost so, heavy, really. so i think there the drone rules probably you know <laughs> probably sort of help a little <laughs> sorry russ i feel mm. bad now <laughs> No, he's a good chap, though. He's a good, good chap. Good. Yeah. I've got two small bits of news, if you're done, Hedley. Just, like, mm. really quirky little bits, if, if that makes sense. So we did a video once, probably a year ago, if not sort of seven months ago, from uh, what's called the Strawberry Line, or it's the Cheddar Line. It goes, um, mm. it went from sort of Bristol direction down into uh, sort of Cheddar direction. I, I can't remember the exact stations, but one of the stations on there was called Congressbury, and a, a bit of disused station. And it's on a pathway or probably a cycle route. Can't remember the exact details, but a wonderful team have been down there and cleared mm. this vegetation. Because when we went there, we just about sort of poked around in the hedge and you can just about see the old masonry from the station, Congressby Station. Beautiful thing. And all these volunteers from the local area have gone down there and they've cleared mm. like 200 yards each side of vegetation. Yeah. So all of a sudden now you've got this wonderful old picturesque uh, masonry lined uh, mm. platforms and it looks beautiful and I just thought I'd love to mention that because that you know it, it's I love it when a little community sort of comes together and they all yeah. get busy and make their area sort of a, a big tip to the old railway that was there in their heritage then that was really really quite interesting so but um, vegetation doesn't usually stop you though does it I was talking to Rebecca about this when we were doing the filming you walking along three of us then <laughs> you'll quite happily throw yourself down into a ditch and start poking around with a camera and oh i love that love it it's, just, it's a good you're feeling, in your natural it? habitat it's a, it's a good feel <laughs> you know I, I always think that i always think that do you know what I can, I, I, I can physically and i'm privileged enough to be able to be outside because mm. there's many that can't I just, yep. do you know what yeah I, I will always try and savor that ability to just yeah. dive in a hedge and 
hurt myself probably, but look an idiot, yeah. but who cares? Because I, I, I love the... You know, I try, it's as, brilliant. I think brilliant. as you get older, you sort of appreciate the silly little things in life, don't you? And that's definitely one of them. Yeah, um, no, do it. Do it while you can. But yeah, that's, so that's, that's, well done the team mm. at Congress, but I don't know who they yeah, are. Yeah, that's good. But that really, good. really good to see. And <clears throat> finally, another quick thing I've been obsessing about, um, sunken lanes should mm. probably be a whole topic um, of another another podcast, I'm sure. But I mm. came across one of these really sort of rubbishy, clickbaited newspaper, local newspaper mm. articles. And that sort of led me on to the, the wider picture. That, um, I think it might be Bournemouth University. I might be wrong, but Bournemouth mm. University are doing a project where they are going to try and map mm. hundreds of sunken lanes. So uh, mm. you're probably immediately thinking of Urchfont in Wiltshire yeah, where font, you did a yeah. drone shot yeah. looking yeah. up it so there's loads of those there's loads of those in, in um, Dorset so we're going to go and look at those quite soon but um, yeah I think I think it's Bournemouth University I could be wrong mm. who are basically going to map it but they're not just mapping it they're sort of using sort of um, almost like on-site LIDAR for want of a better word mm. so they're literally okay. they're going to put they put down these probes in the middle of the lane and they map every little detail all of the sort of the nooks and the crannies along the 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 the, the, um, the lane. I don't know why. Mm. It's a long term project that probably sort of looks at how they how they change over over time. But I just thought, do you know what? I'm going to get a little bit obsessed with that because it's fascinating. Yeah. They're beautiful pictures, aren't they? Oh yeah. They, I mean, they. I think they. I think I read someone tagged us on Twitter yesterday. I think, and I think they've yep. done Dorset already. Oh really. Um, I think, you know, I, I haven't had a lot of time to be honest with you, but um, I'm pretty sure that Dorset's already done. I'm a and, bit behind uh, there in that case. That would be great. I mean, I've, there's a few. Surrey's got some nice ones. I don't, I don't think yeah. they're within Wessex remit, and we obviously at the moment our remit seems to be a little bit too far to the east, and we need to spread to the west somehow. But um, sunken lanes, I mean, they make beautiful pictures. Yeah. Um, you know, and and what I did is for. I'm probably going to print one up for our Wiltshire exhibition, our Wessex Airscapes. But I, I the one you're on about in Urchfont, I actually flew the drone up. I thought you uh, did. just under the canopy of the trees. Yeah. And then took pictures down into the, uh, the ditch. The um, yeah, and it, it's it's amazing, absolutely amazing, what you can get, especially in the autumn as well, when you've got the yeah, canopy yeah, of the of trees course. and you know. Yeah. 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 Super. No, I love sunken lane. Well, I'm done yeah. for news headlines. Yeah, my my um. Two mm. news items that I thought were worthy of a, worthy That's of a mention. Good. Well, we got. Um, I'm, I've got a topic today, Lowbury Hill. But did you have? Did you have a topic? Well, my topic was going. To, I, I was inspired by your drone topic last week. I thought, well, you're mm. going to do this Lowbury Hill, so mm. that's sort of a bit more informative. So I thought, do you know what? I'll do a quick how to YouTube because I that's get I get idea. asked so many questions, and I can mm. bullet point it nicely and succinctly. I think. Um, so yeah, do you want to fire with Lowbury? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, if anyone listening on was it, YouTube, I guess is the easiest thing. So if you don't want to hear me waffling about a beautiful <laughs> area that I love called Lowbury Hill and you prefer to get ahead with your YouTube, then use the slider here just to fast forward it a little bit. But, um, um hopefully people will stay with me. But uh, speaking, so, of which, speaking of which, if you yeah. are listening or watching on YouTube, because we do have this on YouTube and podcast, as Headley said, then um, we often put pictures of what we're talking about as, as mm. overlay. So it's not just our yeah. ugly mugs for an hour. We're, so Headley's going to waffle now about Lowbury Hill and you're going to send me a bunch of pictures, right, Headley? Or yes, not? that's that's the way it's done. That's the, <laughs> yeah, that's the way it's done. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that's the best, best way to do it. But I think we've... Probably most of our listeners are on Spotify or Apple thingy, whatever it's called, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, but we do have a YouTube channel as well where we can provide illustration to what we're saying, hmm. um, which is called Wessex Ways as well. So look that up on YouTube. So Lowbury Hill. Um, I came across it accidentally. Um, it's probably about three and a half miles from where I'm sitting now. It's kind of my local high point. Um, it's in the Berkshire Downs, um, and it's a hill. It's 186, 187 metres high, so we're not exactly talking the Alps here, but... So, you know, sorry, are we east or hmm. west of, of where you're sitting now? 
So I'm in Didcot, and yep. this is to the southeast. Southeast, um, okay. And it's right beside the ridgeway. Um, there is no easy way to get to it. Um, oh, look at that! Yeah, I'm, it, well, very I'm, remote. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, um, I'm, for the benefit of anyone listening, I'm actually now looking on Google Maps and and um, OS Maps, yeah. so I can I can follow what Headley's saying. So forgive me yeah. for my wows so, and, um, and ours. This is where I've got to get it right. I'm not going to get my directions right. <laughs> but there, there are three main ascents. So you can go from Streetly Warren, uh, so near the village of uh, Streetly. Um, and that that's a, a, a reasonably steep climb up the ridgeway, followed by a little bit of flat, and then you've got to kind of leave the ridgeway and di- divert a little bit. Uh, you can ascend from Compton in Berkshire, um, nice gentle climb, not very scenic I would say, but it's it's a it's a relatively good climb. Um, you can and the way I usually go because it's obviously from my house is from uh, the what we call the dryers. There's a little parking place uh, just to the south of Aston Tyrold, um, oh, and yeah. you can ascend. You can ascend there up through Juniper Valley. Now, Lowbury Hill is very remote. Um, yeah. The immediate appeal to it, we do guided walks up there. So myself, Anna, and a, a lady uh, who runs uh, walking. Uh, organization called Pipstick Walks. So, Philippa, hello, Philippa. I know she listens to this. Um, so, uh, we do. We've been doing walks up there, um, and uh, Anna and myself, you know, and and Philippa do stop and do a little bit of uh, guidance as to where we are and, and everything. Um, and um, the immediate appeal to it is are the views. So, bearing in mind we're in the south of England, sort of southeast of England, you can see. Oh, I've forgotten how many counties. I think it's seven counties you can see from the top. Mm-hmm. And you've got kind of about 300 degrees worth of views from the top. So it's not full 360, but it's not far off yeah. um, in every direction. And it, it's wonderful. I mean, it, it's it's so open. You feel like you're, you know, you look around, it feels like you're on a mini version of Dartmoor or something up there. Mm. You don't feel like you're in the middle of the south of England. You don't see anyone else up there as, as well. And yet it's convenient to get to kind of from the Ridgeway. Um, as far as access is concerned, it's, uh, it hasn't really got a footpath going into it. It's If yeah. you look on the OS map, there isn't. Um, however, and and also it's not marked as open access either, but the farmer has put a pedestrian gate in with a sign saying keeps dog on a, keep dogs on a lead. Oh, that's good. That's good. I've been up there many a times. I mean, I go up there at least once a week, um, <clears throat> and I've seen the farmer up there, spoken to him, and ever such a nice bloke. Um, not wanting to increase the footfall in any way. I don't, I don't think we've got the reach for that, but um, mm-hmm. um, it is definitely worth a diversion. Um, so there, there's lots of things up there. So one one thing at the top is you've got the outline on the top of the hill of a Roman enclosure. Now, some people yeah. say it's a Roman temple. Some people say it's a Roman building. It's flanked on the north and the east by two barrows as well. Um, and from those barrows, they've excavated two people. One they've called Lowbury Man, uh, who looks to be quite, looked to have been quite prominent and wealthy, and one uh, called Lowbury Lady, uh, who quite the opposite. Uh, I'm, and I'm not quite sure what orientation they were buried in, but apparently that's significant. Yeah. Now, down in Goring nearby, uh, they recently did. Um, a small exhibition for Lowbury Hill, which had a number of artifacts, um, and that were and and it had one of my pictures and one of Anna's pictures there, mm-hmm. and there was a talk by a lady called Summer Courts. Now Summer is doing a PhD in Lowbury Lady. I mean, it's a very very specific PhD, mm. but she's heavily involved in the history of Lowbury Hill and you know the the findings from various um, excavations up there. And um, I've been sending her pictures. In fact, I had an email from her asking if I'd be her aerial photographer. Um, I sent numerous pictures to her um, taken during the frost and the warm weather. And we've discovered more earthworks on the top. Um, okay. I'm not I'm not going to go into 
any more detail on that now because I don't know how you know, confidential that is or whatever. But certainly there's something else up there and uh, she's yeah. now looking into that. Um, and I'm going to be uh, you know, going up there and taking regular uh, mm. photo shoots up there. Um, it's uh, there's this bit. Lowbury Hills had a, a lot of sort of other bits of history attached to it. So, um, let's have a look. Yeah, so it was a dummy radio site during World War Two. So they put dummy masts up, lights on, and everything. Okay. So to for the the, the Luftwaffe to empty yeah. their bombs before they got to anywhere more significant. Mm-hmm. There was a control room for that down in the valley as well. Yeah. Um which uh, you can just about see to this day as well. Yeah, and I really. believe one one of the German reconnaissance planes crashed up there as well. Okay. Um so you've got all of that. It's also touted as the most probable site of the Battle of Ashdown. Um, I've got to be very careful what I say here because there's no record that explains exactly where that happened. A lot of people think it might have happened over uh, towards Uffington, uh, especially as the Berkshire Downs used to be called Ashdown in in their entirety. Yeah. Um, But the Battle of Ashdown, uh, or some people call it the Battle on the Hill, so it was King Ethelred, um, and you had the future King Alfred, Alfred the Great, um, basically two Saxon armies and then the Danes were coming up after their victory at Reading uh, and they wanted to probably take Wantage so they're coming along the Ridgeway and the Fair Mile which is a long straight path that goes yeah. from Lowbury Hill Got down that. to Molesford to cross the Thames probably used to be the original path of the Ridgeway and so you've got King Standing Hill there where it's likely that someone like Alfred looked oh, out for the see. Danes yeah, okay. Yep. And then in the Valley of Unhill, immediately to the east of Lowbury Hill, they found certain uh, Danish artefacts. And, of course, it's called Dean's Bottom as well, which yeah. comes from the original... Originally, it was called Dane's Bottom. So there's a lot of sort of naming evidence around there that maybe yeah. the battle happened there. Uh, but, again, I don't want to say that because, you know, um, I'm going to be corrected by historians on that and accused of rewriting <laughs> history. <and stuff. laughs> but uh, there's a lot... There's a lot of oysters on top of the hill as well because the Romans used to eat oysters. They were a delicacy. Okay. So you can actually find oysters on the top. Just trying um, to think of where the nearest Roman road is or proper Roman is it proper. But, there's um, probably one down going into the village of Cholsey. Coming out south of Cholsey. Cholsey oh, being to the north. Tadley, only yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tadley just further south, so that and yeah. I think Tadley to Oxford direction was wrong, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's there's a gentleman I'm going to give a bit of a shout out to here called Jason Warshall, and he has been busy recreating artifacts that have been found at Lowbury Hill. Yeah. Um, and if you, uh, and and again, if you want to see Lowbury, I think it's Lowbury Man. I think he's in the Vale and Downland Museum. Um, so anyway, but anyway, the hill, the hill itself. Um, is, is is wonderful and it, it's got valleys kind of to the to the north to the east and to the northwest it's got three valleys going down from it uh yeah. juniper valley to the south it won't be marked on an os map as juniper valley um is absolutely stunning it's a triple si it's got juniper bushes growing in it uh in on the shady side um and it's just a really wonderful place there's no mobile signal there at all and it's mm-hmm. it's deadly quiet until one of the planes from Heathrow goes over. Mm-hmm. It's it's deadly quiet. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful valley. And then you've got Oven Bottom to the west. Now, Oven Bottom is like Juniper Valley is an open access area. Uh, I think it's meant to be the hottest place in Oxfordshire in the summer. Um, the problem is uh, the paths in there have recently been cut off. Um, well, yeah, because so, I'm looking at that now. Mm, Again, we're, sorry for those yeah. who are on the podcast. We've got that mm. on the map on the YouTube video, and you can see it's it, two of those are islands now. Yeah, yeah. So um, that ties in nicely with the video that you did recently yeah. on open access areas that you can't get to. <clears throat> and then to the east, you've got the Unhill Valley, uh, which is really, really beautiful, and you've got Grimsditch in that and. And then you've got the the big hills, unhill the other side. 
and that whole area is wonderful for sunset so what yeah. i plan to do in the summer I've, I've sold a few pictures actually of sunsets looking towards lowbury hill or from lowbury hill um so in the summer i'm gonna get myself a decent head torch go up there get some aerial shots at sunset and then uh, use the head torch to get sort of the 45 minute plus trek back down to the car yeah um really don't fancy getting you know twisting my ankle in a rabbit hole on the <laughs> way down there's also a lot of slippery chalk paths around there so the ridgeways yes. and support paths at the moment are really quite slippery so you've got to be very very careful but uh yeah it's, it's a fascinating place mm. it's not um dramatic in any way but if you like your views and you like your solitary walks lowbury hill is, is the place to go Definitely. So I've I've been there before once, Eddie. Do you know why I've been there? Uh, yes, now I'm going to guess here. Yeah, I'm go going to guess. Yep. It will be something to do with the Didcot to Southampton Railway. Yeah. Which runs so, nearby, ran nearby. I'll bring up the map. But yeah, so if you head exactly two kilometres or 2.2 kilometres to the west. Hmm. Um, Churn Holt. Churn Holt. And I'll yep. zoom in on the map. So basically, yeah, there we go. Chernholt, it was north of Compton um, yep. on the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton Railway. And I'm mm. guessing it was south of Upton because I think Upton was a station before Didcot. Yeah, yeah, it um, was. And you can still see the um, the station at Upton. It's now a house and they've got the, yeah. the platform out the back. In, in, not that I've been looking in people's gardens, no. but uh, I am told that they've still got the platform in their rear garden. Let's, oh, let's put it that way. Well, you can walk um, a lot of that south of there. You can walk mm, a lot of the railway, it looks. The did but, quite, yeah. Yeah, as you get towards this section we're talking about, back to um, Churn Holt, it mm. becomes private. I think, you know, we, this inspired, mm. this was this was sort of one of the videos that kicked us into making YouTube videos because this mm. is so remote, as you've already described. We thought, yeah. oh, wouldn't it be good to find some remote stations and tell their story? So find mm. a remote station and, and say, why is this station here? Because there's nothing there to serve it. And I think it was an mm. army camp in the First World War. A mm. rifle range. Yes, and they had a, it was a, a rifle range. That's right. Yeah, yeah, they had some competitions yeah. there, I think, didn't they? But you, you can't help but think with the DS... Sorry, the D... Did Cotton Newbury uh, DNSR. DNSR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help but think, if that had still been running today, how fewer lorries you'd have going up and down the A34. Yeah. And... Um, and it's 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 wonderful. I mean, the the actual bit where the ridgeway itself crosses the DSNR yeah. is one of the pictures that I've sold the most of, and I've had oh, okay. um, a lady called Ruth Rothery paint it as well. I yeah. I do have an exclusive agreement with Anna Dillon on painting my pictures, but um, yeah, yeah. with Ruth we made a bit of an exception, and um, it's really really nice. I put the drone up just to the west of that, ha over the railway. Yeah where the railway used to be itself yeah and then look look back at the the bridge and i've done it in all four seasons yeah and it's just such a lovely view you see the, the the railway going off into the distance um and yeah. it's the the whole area is really really nice it's very very quiet um it's not one of the better known parts of the ridgeway but as you go further east it then climbs up and then drops down into streetly warren which yeah. is a picture that i posted today and that that is better known it is uh, you know, lots of earthworks and a, a quite a deep valley. Um, and uh, I think James Dyson owns a lot of the, what, the land around there as well. Right. right. But, uh, yeah, lovely area. Yeah. And Lowbury Hill is, is the place I go to the most when I'm not at work. It's, you know, from my house, you can cycle it um, in an hour or so. You can um, park nearby and walk up there and it's you don't see anyone else. It's, it's really, really nice. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. A worthy walk and a worthy mention. Mm, definitely 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 mm. so i was gonna i was gonna waffle about youtube again inspired by your um drone how to drone last week i thought it was really useful mm. really interesting quite insightful even for someone that does fly a drone um mm. myself I, I sort of found it very useful um so i thought well you know what well you you've done something that is pertaining to wessex ways i'll do something about youtube because we're, we're often asked um, especially about like a, we've got a bunch of patrons and they some of those have got YouTube channels and they always say oh, how do you how do you do it you know what, what what's the best thing to do it and they always ask for advice mm. um, and now when we started out I think our biggest mistake was we didn't really take advice we just mm. made a YouTube video thought oh this is really good fun loved it and then 
just plodded along. Oh, should we do another one? Yeah, let's do another video, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And we fell into it that way of doing it, and that was great. But then we started going, okay, well, why is this video not got as many views as the last one? Why is this one not doing as well? All those sort of questions spiral in your head. Now you've sort of, now you're interested in the process. Mm. You start to sort of question, right, well, why is that video not doing so well? And people give you advice, but you rarely listen to it. It's it's a silly thing. You just go, oh, yeah, whatever. I'll just get on and do it. So my biggest piece of advice is listen to advice. That sounds a bit, bit strange, but, you know, there were, we had a few... Um, I don't know, you're calling your peers. They said, oh, yeah, mm. why don't you change this? Or why don't you make your videos a bit shorter? Or change the thumbnail? And you're just like, well, I, I make it, so I know what I'm doing. And yeah, you're talking to people that have got 100,000 subscribers, so why, why hell are I not listening to this person? Um, now, one of the one of the most interesting things, what they always try and say, so I'll, I'll bullet point this. I'm not going to do a massive... Um, how to because that's an hour in its own you know right i sort of wanted to do a 10 15 minute waffle on it so i'll I'll try and bullet point this and again the benefit of those watching on youtube is i'll put the bullet points up on the screen as well so bullet point number two is find your niche because if you're making a video about something yeah if i said to you right headley tell me all about drone photography and do a talk on it as you're going to do you'd you'd be in your element You'd be like, oh, right, well, if I said, right, yeah. how, how do I get a really good shot here? Eddie? What do I do? You'd be you'd be stood there with a bit of passion in your voice because you'd know. Mm. You'd know what works. You'd know where the sun is. You'd know where this is. You know how the light's going to work. You know what lens is going to All these different things. And you talk about it with passion. And that's the mm. biggest, biggest thing that comes across on YouTube is you can watch somebody who doesn't have passion and you don't become interested. But if someone was, you know, someone said on one of our videos the other day, God, you could make a video about my ceiling and I'd probably still watch it because of the way you're talking about it. Mm. And I thought, well, that, that probably goes a long way because it sort of highlights that actually, you, if you're interested in something, you talk about it with passion and you can mm. really get across why you're so excited about this hedgerow or this ditch or the, the embankment or whatever it mm. is. And you can convey your interest in the viewer you've captured their imagination too whatever the subject so find your niche mm. um i won't do equipment because equipment's a bit boring suffice to say it doesn't really matter as long as you get the audio right people will continue to watch even if your visual isn't great people will still watch even if your mm. camera's a bit wonky or that shot's a tiny bit blurry for a second or two or you do jump cuts all the time. It doesn't really matter with YouTube. People live on jump cuts. We try and make a nice processed film that you would hopefully find on a TV documentary or something nice. But it doesn't matter. I can spend hours trying to perfect a visual edit, but it doesn't matter as long as you get the audio right. So use your phone. doesn't matter as long as you get the audio right. And that's the biggest sort of um, production tip. Um, mm. with editing um, in terms of the, the that side of things get yourself a basic program get yourself something like iMovie on the Apple or get yourself a real movie maker really basic thing first of all learn how that works and learn how a timeline works and then you can start to think about how it all fits together then you can sort of move up a level we we started on something called power director i think you can buy it for 50 yeah. quid or whatever that's what i use yeah. yeah and that's great do you know what that did us for two or three years rebecca mm. still uses it so if rebecca puts out a video out because she does sporadically rebecca still uses power director and it's, there's nothing wrong with it i mean there is something wrong with it but there's nothing wrong with it you can do a lot yeah. of stuff with it um yeah I was convinced to go over to Adobe Premiere Pro and I'm pleased I did. It took me a while to make that jump from PowerDirector to Premiere Pro. Um, mm. But it wasn't beyond the realms of possibility. You just have to YouTube a few things. You have to YouTube, right, how do I do that on it? How do I do that? But when you mm. do it, there's so much more and you mm. realise why that's kind of a, a step up. I don't want to sound pretentious, but it's, it's a step up and it, there's a lot more you can do if you invest the time to learn how to do it. But Power Director is great. Mm. And if Adobe fell over tomorrow, I'd be back on Power Director tomorrow. Because but it's, it's the same with most, like, without wanting to advertise Adobe, so to speak. But yeah, in the ph- photography world, you sort of progress to Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom. And, yeah. uh, you know, if it's it can be a bit overwhelming to, to begin with if you don't know what you're doing. But 
you know it, it's it's it is you pay for it and it's better yeah it's been you know and it's the same with premiere pro if you're going to make professional level videos that's going to be a, a more powerful tool than something like power director and you know yeah. i use power director but video is not necessarily my thing so for my fragile beginner mind it's great but if i was yeah, oh, it still go, works as well. and you, and if i was going to do yeah. it with the regularity and the professionalism that you do i, I wouldn't be using the power director yeah sure mm. it's, it, it's, it's an interesting subject and it's interesting to see what other people i think people use final cut pro as well um mm. things like that but i think mainly uh, adobe premiere pro is the way to go if you if you do it yeah. regularly as, as eddie says um the other one I, think I wanted to touch briefly on the style of video that people make. Mm. And again, I would say with YouTube, anything can work if you if you have the passion about it. But if you want mm. to learn, find find a YouTube channel that you love and try and copy that style, not the not the copy of the YouTube channel, but copy that yeah. style with your own take. So, you know, when we started out, there's three or four YouTubers that we really liked watching so we thought okay well let's learn right uh, watch a one minute sequence of that person and i'm still doing that today literally mm. today i'm still doing that um excuse me i'm watching um i'm a bit obsessed at the moment with a guy called johnny harris got like three million subscribers and he's got a mm. team of people working for him that edit yeah. for him and do all sorts i think i mentioned to you before but there's a lot of stuff in his videos which uh, uh, sort of is a level up in terms of production mm. value. And I'm, all I'm doing is taking a 10 second clip from one of his videos and I'm taking that to one side and I'm saying, right, exactly how did he do that 10 seconds? I love it and I'm hugely invested in this video he's made, 20 minutes long and I'll watch every single one of his videos. But I'm mm. obsessed with how he does it. So I literally take a 10 second clip and I sit mm. down put it in my time and I go right exactly what's he done what's that sound right that's what they call a sting or a drop so I can download those stings and drops where the sound goes mm. doom, like this and, and yeah. all these little little things so you'll notice a few of those in the Thames uh, source video Headley. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed oh, but right. the first two minutes have got lots of weirdities and that is all inspired by one person called Johnny Harris but the point okay. being you can do this. Anyone can do it. I don't mm. mean you, Heather, but anyone can do this. If you're interested in making a YouTube video, learn how to do it. Find somebody that you love in terms of watching it inspires you and learn how to do it because it's, it's not difficult mm. if you just invest the time to try and sort of learn what you like about their videos, which is what we still do. Um, point number six, believe it or not, um, thumbnails which is disappointingly the single most important thing on YouTube. Mm, yeah. So I always use the analogy that Steven Spielberg could call himself Bob Smith, right? Hide himself in the pseudonym Bob Smith, and he could make a fully-fledged production, a two-hour Steven Spielberg quality movie, a brand new movie. He could set up a YouTube channel under the name Bob Smith, and he could put his 20 billion pound production on the YouTube channel and it would flop immediately, right? Because nobody knows it's him. He hasn't got a big following and he's put a thumbnail out that's not attractive, mm. right? So if nobody sees that thumbnail or the way YouTube works is, let's say you've got 100 subscribers, right? YouTube will potentially show that 100 people or they won't, they'll show 10 people. But let's say they show that 100 people. If 10 people watch it, when they see it on their timeline, so you're flicking through your um, phone or you're flicking through your mm. desktop and you're looking through YouTube, you've got a split second to catch that person's imagination. So YouTube shows 100 people. Now, you have that split second to capture it because if YouTube um, sees that 10 people have clicked mm. on that video, they'll go, oh, OK, that's pretty good. That's 10%. You've got a 10% click-through rate. 10 people clicked on it when we showed a hundred, therefore ten percent. Mm. So what they're gonna do now, YouTube gonna go, well we'll find people that like that kind of video and we'll show another hundred and another ten people watch it from that hundred. And they go, oh, ten percent, pretty good. We're up the game now. We're gonna show five hundred new people. So five hundred people get to see this this video that you've just produced or Steven Spielberg's just produced. And if 50 people watch it they'll say yes yeah, still going really well 10 percent is very good click-through rate that's how a viral video works 
Mm. So if the thumbnail doesn't work and Steven Spielberg has just done his major new £20 billion movie with a rubbish thumbnail that doesn't capture anybody's imagination, no one will see it. And that is a travesty because you can make the best production, the best quality, the best value film that you've ever done in your life. But if you don't get the thumbnail right, your viewers Mm. won't see it. It's the cover of the book, isn't it? Yeah, it's the cover of the book. And you have to... uh, The worst thing is you've got a split second to Mm. grab somebody by the lapels and say, this is the video you want to watch. It's that good. Mm. And people Mm. always say, oh, you don't need to clickbait your videos. You don't need to do that. And you you, you say, you do, because you wouldn't be watching my videos if I didn't clickbait. Mm. And I don't mean clickbait in in a really bad sense. I know what you mean. mean, Draw people in visually. Yeah, Yeah. legit bait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the main crux of YouTube is the thumbnail. Um, mm. Enjoy it. Have the passion behind it. Make a tight edit. There's a really good YouTube channel at the moment. I won't go into huge detail, but a, a, a guy called Auto Shenanigans. And he does Secrets of the M6, Secrets of the M4. He's, he's a very good auto yeah, guy. Yeah, I've seen him. He yeah. only does eight, nine, ten minute long videos. I, and I, I don't want to insult him, but there's no production in terms of... There's no fancy um, music or anything. Mm. It's just fact, 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 drone shortage mm. overlay, drone shortage overlay. Really interesting facts, really well researched, lovely guy. He's very funny, but he does a nine minute video and he hits with fact, 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 fact. Interesting, mm. interesting, interesting. And that's it. Boom, job done. He's got 70,000 subscribers. He only started like a year ago. And he gets 70 plus thousand views per video comfortably and more. Mm. 150,000 last week, 200,000 weekly videos. Boom, 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 boom. Continually. Um, hold on. My thing is telling me I need to restart Windows, which I'm not going to do. Mm. <laughs> but the, the point being, if you tight, make a video tight, no gaps, no messing around. The video we've mm. done this week with um, Tim Dor, that's not going to yeah. do very well. Why? Because I did a waffly one minute long intro. And that I like that intro though. I you I had the luxury of seeing the draft of that yes. before. I don't know how it's changed since then. I haven't had a chance yet to watch it and I will, obviously. Um and I'll I'll share it as well. But it I I think that intro was really, really good. And it would be a shame if that would spoil anything and I can't see the wood. It's it's one minute long and it was yeah. It was quite cinematic, and I quite like that. And I, and I love that, and I will never stop mm. doing that, but YouTube mm. doesn't like it. Because, yeah. let's say, ten people, mm. you know, five of them may like that for the same reason you do, same reason as I do. I, I like doing a bit of cinematography. I like doing a bit of mm. a mix of different things and the music, and I love that piece of music, so I thought, I want mm. to use it. I don't care what, I'm using that bit of music. Yep. And... But five people will want to skip to the good stuff. They'll want to go, well, I want to know what that is. So most of the time you'll see us start talking about the video straight away. Mm. But I think this, and, and that's the point I'm trying to make. You keep it tight and it will do better than it will if you don't keep it tight, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, and above all, tell a story. Mm. I think the, 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 the journey you go on in that video, again, is one of the most important things. I think if you could capture someone early on in the video and you can sort of, you know, do what we tried to do in the Thames video, which was try and um, give them a hint of what you're doing, what went yeah. wrong last time, where you're going with it this time. As long yeah. as you follow a story for a video, I think you've then captured somebody as yeah. well. Um, yeah, exactly. And then you met your mate, how your mates bought it, da 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 that sort of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but did you see that um, recent Lex Fridman interview with mr beast still haven't watched it still haven't watched okay it. Mm. so not not to boil down a long interview to you know um a short you know two points but he he basically says i mean that this guy I, I don't know how many he's he's the most watched person on youtube and we're talking and about therefore, mr beast, yeah, mr. beast. Mr. beast. Yeah. so therefore the most watched filmmaker in history or mm. video maker rather and you know his his videos and he i think his three points were Number one, above everything, above everything, make a good video. Number yeah. two, thumbnail. And number three, if you can, try and give away a million pounds per video. <laughs> now, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I doubt number three is something you've 
yet considered but uh, <laughs> but but his, his insight was was fascinating and he also gave the future of youtube and all yeah. that sort of stuff so yeah um and okay i don't think he's been lucky as such i think there's obviously there's an element of luck but he's been very clever to get where he yeah. is and his videos are engaging to a younger audience i hasten to add but he is surprisingly intelligent for someone of his age yeah. Um, and he had quite a lot to offer in that. And a Lex Fridman interview, anyway, is always going to give you a lot of information. But yeah. I was I was surprised how insightful Mr. Beast or whatever the hell his real name yeah. is. Anytime you was. see an interview, he is a very clever guy. He knows exactly mm. what he's doing. Mm. Um, obviously, because of his huge mm. success. And yeah, yeah. The give a, give away a million pounds of video, of course, that <laughs> certainly helps, doesn't it? But but it's a business model. It's mm. yeah, he can give away a million pounds per video because he's making a lot more mm. than a million pounds mm. per video for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, obviously. And um, and his does fluctuate. I mean he was talking about prize money that he gives out, you know, he said anything above a hundred thousand and it engages people, you know. We gave a hundred thousand people a hundred thousand to the winner who can stay in this circle the longest or something yeah. like that. And anything a hundred thousand to a million pound didn't make much difference to the viewership but oh, really? below a hundred hundred thousand pound for most people is a life-changing amount of money yeah and below that it's it it's not perceived as being as life-changing anyway oh, okay but i i met one of your uh you and rebecca's biggest fans online uh last week week before week before last right. and he's he's only i'm not going to mention him by name uh but he's only subscribed to two channels one of them is yours <laughs> uh, <laughs> And the other one is Michael Portillo's. So okay. I don't know what, read into that what you will. But um, yeah, Brilliant. You're, you're, you're in the same kind of uh, category as Michael Portillo. Michael Portillo. I need to start wearing some funky, funky trousers, don't I, in that case? Yes. Or you need similar. To, you, you've, you're halfway there with the received pronunciation as well. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. Right, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waffle too much more that about incredible. how to make a YouTube video. Really, it's it's mm. it's um it's been such a wonderful, weird learning curve and journey for mm. us that we're still learning every day. And yeah. you know, I don't want to sort of say, "Yay, we're great," because we've, we still learn every day and we still make mistakes every day. Yeah. But it's a fascinating learning curve, really. And um, mm. yeah. Oh, the one last thing, which I'm sure Mr. Beast would agree with. You can't stop. No. You, you can't have no. a break because your no. subs will drop and your views, the following video. And again, people will always be kind and say, mm. have a week off. We'll still be here. And you kind of want to say some, you won't I think be. that depends on the type of video though, doesn't it? Because who's that guy who did Unfinished London? Who oh, does Jay Unfinished Foreman. London? Yes, Jay Foreman. So Jay, Jay Foreman only makes a video once every few months. But yeah. His method of making videos looks very intensive. I mean, yeah. every single shot is is. Um, I think it's very difficult. He's trying to get a lot of content into a small video, yeah. and the precision that he needs to do that in, as well as doing the humour that he does, yeah. involves a, a hell of a lot of cutting and um, you know turning up in places just for a two second shot and stuff like that so i can see that those videos probably take half a year to make and that's yeah. for him probably the appeal of his channel but yeah. that's different to most people most people are you know just want nice good enthralling content and, you know people say about your videos they say about i think it was anna dylan said it was a, a rabbit hole that she found herself down after two or three of them and uh you know <laughs> i mean that's hopefully what we try and offer yeah i mean yeah you, you, jay yeah he's got the benefit of being incredibly funny oh, but, and yeah. and i think yeah, yeah as you say funny. you he's got a, a 10 minute video every mm. second there is something funny a little yeah. easter egg going on in the background yeah and yeah it must take him well it clearly takes him months to make a video um yeah, there's there's a lot going on so i think he's almost the exception that proves a rule that yeah yeah he, i yeah. haven't seen anyone else do it that way uh, yeah. you know every single and it, uh, i think videos work along the same method as podcasts you see every podcast that i listen to i mean i mean the notable one one of my favorites is chris williamson's modern wisdom and he produces two podcasts a week and they're right. on youtube and spotify and apple yeah. thingy um and yet he has big guests, you know, every single yeah. guest who comes along is, is huge. And the, the amount of workers, I, the guy probably never sleeps, to be honest with you. But, 
but yeah, he he relies on frequency above everything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think yeah, Jay Foreman is 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 definitely the exception. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've had a few. I've had a few mysteries sent in. By I've got a couple from... as well, Edley. We've got we've got Have a you? nice little mystery section this week. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I I don't know if many. Well, let's start with yours because let's start with yours. Uh, there's probably just stuff ideas for future discussions rather than you know. Yeah, uh, too good deep point. Now, yeah, but, good point. Yeah. Well, we can we can almost tick off again. We're not going to we're not going to detail here, but we can almost tick off <laughs> the the source of the Thames. I think we've done that. Now. This could be the last time we mention it ever. Watch the video though, and I, I'm video. I'm not I don't stand to gain monetarily, so I'm just saying watch the video because I've seen <laughs> your first draft of it, and I think it's just such a good day. For anyway, yeah, watch the video. <laughs> I also want to, but one thing I want to ask people, it's not so much a mystery, but it almost is a mystery, is I want to get back onto the sunken lanes. Mm. So if people... Holloways. Sunken lanes, sunken ways, all that sort of thing. If yeah. people want to let us know where their local sunken mm. lane is, I'd be really appreciative of that. We, I've, I've identified maybe six or seven in Dorset. Um, mm. We're meeting a lady that draws maps very soon. Um, and we're going to go and meet her in one of those sunken lanes. But if anyone knows any more, like, even in, in Wiltshire, other than Urchfont, mm. I'd love to know. Wherever you are, wherever you are in the country mm. listening to this podcast, um, yep. get in touch with us on social media and tell us about the sunken lanes in your neck of the woods and send us some pictures because we'd love to see them. Mm. Um, also, I had an email from a chap called Arthur Edison um, who said, What is Grim's Ditch? Now, it's funny, but I, I had no intention of talking about Grim's Ditch earlier. But now we've talked about it, and I look a right idiot, yeah. because I've written down, what is um, what is Grim's Ditch? And the answer is, we don't know. But yeah, exactly, yeah. But then, yeah. but again, you've already said, Headley, mm. how, is there any good um, academic papers, any evidence? Mm. That, we'd love to know more about Grim's Ditch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're armchair, definitely. you know, sort yeah. of enthusiasts of all these wonderful landscape features. Yeah. So, um, yeah. He also said, and I have no idea where this is, but again, it's one of me and you can look at perhaps in a week. Chedbury Hillfort. Cadbury. No, Cadbury. Because I had one asking about Cadbury Castle. Oh, I don't, I was, I'm, this guy's written Chedbury, C H E. That's Chedbury. Ah, no, I think there is a Chedbury, beg your pardon. Right. Yes. But the quirk of Chedbury is it's not on a hill. Right. And again, I. This could be completely right. It could be leading up the garden path. But Chedbury mm. Hill Fort isn't on a hill. So mm. he said, have a look, see what you think. That's good. So I and North well, Avebury as well. Avebury is effectively a hill fort that's not on a hill, surrounded yeah. by hills. But yeah. yeah. Was that for protection of its, or not protection, was that more of a henge that they weren't overly infused at other people seeing? So they put the, um, the mm. bank around it to act as yeah. a... I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that, got, that's me for mysteries. That's you. So, okay. You, so, <clears throat> okay. So just to finish this off, I've got a few. So, um, again, I'm not going to put names against these, but uh, one says one person. This is this is a video in itself. Define Wessex. <laughs> Two words. <laughs> Define Wessex. So, Wessex. The mm. way I see it is the boundaries of the kingdom of Wessex have changed wildly you know this is the saying the scope of something like this podcast for wessex you can pick your point in time that suits your map best basically yeah. um and you know a lot of people now see wessex as maybe a some cutesy marketing name as a result but people still refer to it i see even historians that i've spoken to recently refer to the area of wessex in its current sort of form um yeah next one where was william marshall's manor in oh i can't read my own writing it <laughs> looks like Cav caversham i think so if that is caversham that's just down the road from here mm. i know nothing about that but that's maybe okay that's maybe something to find so there's obviously a manor yeah. house there missing uh what is the significance of wands dyke there we go. So that can yeah. be put into the Grimm's Ditch folder, I think. But it, I think what, with Wands Dyke, the likelihood is that, like Grimm's Ditch, it was kind of a, a defensive partition barrier, but probably in places or in its entirety, 
maybe the edge of Wessex itself, where it met Mercia at some point. So yeah, I, I, um, I, I, did, did um, Paul and Paul Glyn Kimlet. not suggest yeah. that uh, Bristol University or somebody was uh, was going to publish a paper soon? Mm. Mm. It would well, be really let's hope so. I mean, yeah. So uh, Paul and Glyn remain my main area of validation for anything that relates to Wiltshire, certainly. So mm. um, yeah. Um, so the next one, as I said before, Cadbury Castle. Yep. Was it actually Camelot? So that then leads you on to did Arthur exist, etc., etc. Yeah, I went to Cadbury Castle um, a few weeks back. Terrible weather, didn't see much, um, mm-hmm. but I'm intrigued. It's a really hilly area, um, really beautiful, and you can see Glastonbury Tor from the top. Very yeah. unusual layout. Um, I need to go back there and do some proper photography and read up on it before I go. But a lot of people suggesting that might have been Camelot. And then a lot of people uh, going against that and saying, no, don't be silly. It wasn't Camelot and it wasn't Arthur and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I think that's that's an interesting one, if maybe controversial. Mm. One of them mentioned Churn Holt, believe it or not. Oh, really? There's a lot of coincidences here. Yeah, yeah. Churn yeah. Holt. Um, something about Sir Gilbert Maxwell. Oh, Sir Gilbert Morrill. Maxwell's picture again my writing is terrible I should type this um so that's obviously a a picture that maybe we need to have a look at investigate on Chernholt I've got a few and old finally, pictures actually so I'll have a look I'll have, have a look yeah hmm. and finally Cern Abbas Giant um yep. the guy on the hill with the big willy <laughs> I can say that can't I <laughs> so basically I guess what they're asking there is for history and reasoning why you would paint a large angry man wielding a stick on the side of a hill um in the buff with yeah yeah i mean who knows <laughs> i mean you know yeah. there, there must be something out there on it mustn't there but again yeah. it's, it's down to maybe what... it's why is it sticking up and not down but let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late <laughs> it's getting late isn't it <laughs> all right we've got there's a lot of mysteries there yeah. So, you know, let, let's do the usual thing of asking our listeners to get in touch with any sort of mm. lovely little answers to that. I'm really mm. keen for people to tell me more about Grim's Ditch um, mm. and what that is all about, basically. Yeah. And and I think it goes without saying, I mean, again, we don't benefit monetarily from these podcasts but i think it's it's shown because we've got a few people listening we've had a few mysteries come in and and it would be nice if this could sort of if you could kind of like it and share it and all yeah, that yeah. kind tell, of tell I, your friends about it yeah. i feel quite cheap saying all that but i do want this to to grow and i do i do like you know some of the responses we're getting and please leave mm. a comment good or bad below Comment, comment, yeah. comment. We've, I love the comments on the YouTube. I can only see the ones on the YouTube site, obviously, but I love the comments that we've been getting on previous videos. It's been really, really good. Yeah, we've got yeah. some really, really good listeners who are really engaged. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Right, I reckon we've probably waffled enough, Eddie. Do you think so? Are you, have you waffled I out? Think, I think so. I'm starting to feel it in my voice. <laughs> that's something for me. <laughs> Super stuff. Well, as ever, people, thanks for listening. Uh, we can be found on social media. We shall put all the different links in the um, doobly do or doobly do or whatever Rebecca says below. But we're largely active on Twitter and mm. also in Headley's Facebook group. Uh, what's it called? Ridgeways and Ancient Trackways. It's uh, the Ridgeway and Ancient Trackways of Britain. Which it's, is it's not group. just mine. It's, it was founded by um, someone else, and I'm just one of the people that run it. But yeah, yeah it's enough. it's a really fascinating group. Yeah, so come and come and join the chit chat on social media because we we hang out a lot on there and we're often we waffling to all sorts of weird and wonderful people. Yeah, mm. definitely. There we go. We're done. Thanks, Edley. Thank you very much, Paul. And right. uh, we will uh, we will reconvene in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. See Thanks, you everyone. then. Cheers. <laughs>